burning bushes, speaking donkeys, visions in the night. Is that what we should expect? Today, I'm doing a beginner's guide to God's guidance. So how does God guide us? Well, the first thing to say is that God guides us behind the scenes. That's true of the people in the Bible and it's true of us now. It's the kind of guidance that we're not conscious of but God is doing anyway. And it's because God is the sovereign creator of the world. So he's in charge of everything. Nothing happens outside of his control. Externally, he uses past history and current situations to guide us. Ephesians says, he works all things according to the counsel of his will. And internally, he inclines our hearts to make decisions when we don't even realize it. In their hearts, humans plan their courses, but the Lord established their steps. And in the Lord's hand, the king's heart is a stream of water that he channels towards all who please him. And God doesn't need us to be aware of what he's doing in our lives, the way he's guiding us. But actually, he often does guide us in ways that we are conscious of, that we can play a part in. And that's the second way that God guides us. God guides us through our conscious cooperation. So the rabbi of the Bible, he speaks to and guides his people. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets in many times and in various ways. Now, some of these various ways were supernatural, but often it was through the everyday common or garden reading of scripture. For example, the Psalms are all about how God instructs and guides his people through his covenant word. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways the Lord are loving and faithful towards those who keep the demands of his covenant. That's Psalm 25 is a big deal. Even in Bible times, God's guidance and instruction was still most frequently found in the written scriptures. But what about the speaking donkeys, I hear you ask? Well, absolutely. Some of these times were supernatural, meaning he guided his people in ways that were not what normally happens in nature. Here's just a few of them. So God spoke to Moses in a burning bush. God used a hand with on-off leprosy. God also used a stick turning into a snake all to persuade God's people to follow him in Exodus 3 to 4. I'm going to just pause for a second here and just show you uh, this AI art fail, which is my first attempt to get a snake to turn into a stick in the desert. Slightly scary. We've got the cloud of smoke and the pillar of fire in Exodus 13 for the people in the desert. There was the Urim and Thummim, which are kind of stones on the breastpiece of the high priest. No one quite knows what they did, but they did a yes, no answer. Hello there. God spoke via the prophets, so he spoke via Jonah's word to the Ninevite or Dathan's rebuke to Samuel. He spoke in a hand on a wall to Kim Belshazzar. He spoke in dreams to Pharaoh in Genesis 41. Hello, me again. Uh, here's another AI art fail. This is AI's first suggestion of a Pharaoh dreaming of cows. Interesting. He spoke in speaking donkeys in Numbers 22, and he also spoke through angels, often giving people a fright, for example, to Gideon in Judges 6 or Mary in Luke 1. But there's qualifications to these because we don't necessarily expect God to guide us in these ways today. And that's because one, narrative isn't normative. Just because it happened in the Bible doesn't mean that it's gonna happen like this today. For example, in the Passover, when the angel of death descended on the city, and every firstborn child in the land was killed, we wouldn't expect that necessarily to happen again. And that's because God acts differently depending on where we are in salvation history and what's happening. So we wouldn't expect God to walk with us like he walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. And we wouldn't expect God to speak to us like he spoke to Moses. So that's up to Jesus, but what about the early church, which is in Acts, kind of closer to where we are now in salvation history? Now, occasionally in Acts, the Holy Spirit does speak to the early Christians. The Holy Spirit told Peter to greet three new potential Christians in Acts 10. Simon, three men are looking for you. The Holy Spirit told the church in Antioch, verbatim, to set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, the mission to the Gentiles. And we've got the vision of the man of Macedonia in Acts 16, where Paul is guided to a new mission field when the man says, come over to Macedonia and help us. But a direct word from the Holy Spirit even in that incredibly important time in the New Testament of the genesis of the early church was firstly one, unusual. So most decisions in Acts were not made with a direct word from the Holy Spirit. For example, have a look at Acts 15. This is the point where the apostles are trying to decide should the Gentiles be circumcised to join the church? And it's a key moment in salvation history and one where you might think they would wait for a direct word from God. But instead, they discussed the scriptures, they came to a decision, 
and then listen to how James describes how he's understood the process. He calls it both my judgment and it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. So a direct word for the Holy Spirit was unusual. It was also unexpected. The apostles were not waiting or expecting direct words from the Holy Spirit. They got on and made decisions. For example, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul says, So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. In Acts 19, after this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem. And in Titus, Paul says, Do your best to come to me at Necropolis, because I have decided to winter here. And thirdly, a direct word from the Spirit is unmistakable. So it's not that the apostles are having these subjective, internalized senses that God might be speaking to them, but rather those words from the Spirit are clear and impossible to misinterpret. So we've looked at up to Jesus and we've looked at the early church, but the question is how then does God guide us today? And the guidance I'm thinking more about is this particular kind of personal guidance that we have which is supernatural, but a bit more subjective. So should we listen to these ways we feel like God might be communicating to us? Maybe it's feelings of peace, um, or do we have a gut feeling about something we think is God speaking in that? Maybe we've got a deep desire, or we have dreams, or maybe inner voices, not necessarily a direct word, but repeated thoughts that seem to come out of nowhere. Or should we look for signs, seeing in circumstances if God's communicating to us? And we do often link these things to the Holy Spirit. Well, how are we supposed to think about those things? Are they God guiding us? Well, if you want to know the answer to that, then I've got a whole video about how God guides us through the Holy Spirit.